All right, well, good morning, ApacheCon. Thank you all for turning out for the first talk of the day. So, um, about me, I'm David North. I work for a UK-based company called Core Filing. Uh, we do our development mostly in Java, and we work for people like financial regulators, banks, insurers, governments. So sort of big conservative financial institutions, which some of you might uh, might know, tends to put some constraints on what you can and can't sell them when it comes to IT. And uh, in the last year or so, we've ventured into microservices and uh, containers and Docker and those sorts of things. So this talk is sort of based on uh, what we've learned and what we've worked out along that journey and are still working out. So, a statement, not a question. We all love Docker. Well, maybe. Um, I'm not going to go into a, a huge amount of detail about why developing applications as lots of little services can work well. Um, it has its pros and cons, but I'm doing it, and I'm assuming at least some of you are doing it as well. Um, quick show of hands, who's using Docker for anything? Quite a few of you. Anyone using Rocket? The lesser known. No, me neither, but uh, I thought it deserved a mention since uh, Kubernetes, which I'll be talking about quite a lot, does support Rocket containers as well as Docker. So, um, I don't, how, how many of you are uh, running a containerized application and selling it to people as a software as a service thing? Okay, well, we are. Um, and uh, how many of you are running containers on premises for yourselves or for customers? Yeah, more of you. So uh, perhaps, you, perhaps you've already gone in the same direction as our thinking. Um, and how do people orchestrate their containers? Who just sort of runs them using Docker Compose? And uh, nothing more complicated than that. Anyone using Kubernetes? One or two hands. Um, anyone doing something else? Mesos, of course. Yes, we're at ApacheCon. How could I forget? And uh, what about the stuff built into Docker? Anyone using uh, their latest bits and pieces? Okay, well... There are a whole bunch of ways that you can do these things, and um, a lot of them there's brilliant support for on big cloud providers. If you want a Kubernetes cluster on AWS, you there are tools shipped for this. You give them your AWS API key and say, I want a cluster about this much hardware. You type one command, and it goes off and makes you one. And if you want one on Azure, it's even easier. Microsoft have got a native support saying, I, just, I want a Kubernetes cluster on my Azure cloud. Click, click, there you go. I don't know if that's out of BT yet, but given that I heard about it at ApacheCon last time around, it might well be. Uh, and maybe you get your ops team to do deployment, or maybe you've embraced the joys of DevOps and people who build things should run them. But what people don't seem to talk about, at least not online, is what happens if your customer doesn't want or can't have software as a service? What if they need your application to come to them, needs to be on their premises? So the situation we often find, given that our clients are people like the UK government who have lots of sensitive tax data that they're virtually prohibited by law from putting in a public cloud, um, what we often find is they say, right, this is our production environment. There's no access to the public internet from these machines, and there never will be. Usually, that's only a back-end restriction, but just occasionally you get someone really paranoid whose front-end machines can't access the public internet. At which point, your front-end developers need to think a bit hard because they've probably pulled in all sorts of fonts and things that are hosted by Google, and you don't want to see what your application looks like when you cut those off. But focusing on the back-end, uh, what's, the, what's the next challenge? These sorts of big enterprise clients often go for Windows as their first-choice operating system, but we found that if we ask nicely, smile sweetly, give a bit of a push, they've got some Linux in there somewhere, it's probably Red Hat. So, as long as it's Red Hat 7, then this conversation can continue. If you're trying to support Docker on uh, Red Hat 6, it's a bit of a nightmare, and it's not officially supported. But thankfully, we've, we've found Red Hat 7 in the cases where we've uh, been asked to do something. So here's a rundown of what we had to find answers to to get our containerized application running on one of these big enterprise client sites with no public internet. So question one, how do we get the Docker images there? Um, obviously, they can't pull them from some sort of registry over the public internet. Given that we're using Kubernetes, how do we install a cluster that functions without the public internet? Uh, databases, our application uses some of them. Should we stick them inside the cluster and treat them as a black box or not? 
how do upgrades take place? How do we stay on top of security updates and patching? These are often things that you have to have answers to on the RFP before you get anywhere near actually doing it. Um, how do the on-site IT team manage all this? They might not have been exposed to containers before, so that can be a challenge. Logging and backup and recovery. So let's take these one at a time. So, first of all, how do we get our Docker images to the client site? Let's pretend for a moment that they've got their cluster running. How do we actually get our application there? So, internally, or on your cloud, it's easy. You know, you have a local registry full of your Docker images. Maybe you push them into Amazon or Azure's registry service, and then you pull them down onto your production system from there. In this case, we have to get a bit more creative, and we have to reach into a dusty corner of Docker that uh, you may not have seen before. So... I think I might want to go to mirrored monitors to make this at all possible. Just give me a moment. Yes, you can see the same thing I can, right. So, there's a lesser known part of Docker, or two lesser known commands, called load and save. So, save does kind of what the name suggests, which allows you to take some Docker images that you've got locally and dump them to a tar file, and then the mirror image command is load. So, you can see what Docker images you've got on your local machine by doing this, and if I do a quick save, run it through gzip, because these things do get quite sizable. This is sort of revealing the innards of how Docker works, that each image is very easy to capture as a tar, and in order to save that image, it's got to produce you a tar that potentially has all of the further up images that build up into Elasticsearch, so if it extends from some Linux image, it's got to save all that as well. Okay, well you get the picture, let's not sit and watch that complete, but just to show that this really does work, if I turn off my Wi-Fi for a moment, now, one of the first things you do when you install Docker is this. Now, normally, of course, if I'd been connected to the public internet, you would have seen it just go, oh, yes, you haven't got Hello World locally, so I'll go and talk to the Docker Hub, I'll pull it down, and then we're up and running. Can't do that, there's no internet. However, earlier on, you can see that I saved one. Um, so, as per the command, we haven't got the Hello World image locally, but it looks like I saved a tar of it earlier, so... That loaded nice and quickly, and if we do Docker images, we can see, oh look, the Hello World image is there, and now if I try that again, still no internet access, by the way, just to prove I'm not cheating. Really isn't, and... So there you are. You can dump Docker images, take them, probably uh, offline to the customer, and get them to load them in at the other end. Never underestimate the bandwidth of a USB drive that you've sent by FedEx. Let's just go back to mirrored screens so I can see my notes. Uh, just bear with me for a moment. Oh, technology. There's a wonderful bug where when I get this right, my laptop screen will go blank because it sets the brightness to zero when... Oh, I'm just going to unplug and replug. Sorry, this is not the smoothest of experiences. That's better. Right, so that's Docker load and save. So that's one of the major hurdles taken care of. And if I could just start my slides again, then we'd be uh, good to continue. Ah, there we go. Right. Okay, so we've got the images there, we've solved that problem. Now, how do we actually get a Kubernetes cluster on this client site where there's no internet access? So what do we need to get the client to give us? Well, follow the system requirements, we'll need at least two machines. Let's say they're running CentOS, which was what I did for my uh, little trial run of this, very similar to Red Hat, as you all know. Um, first thing you need to do is get the client to make sure when you get there, the machines have got Docker installed and they have got Kubernetes installed, so you need to tell them to follow the instructions on the website, install those using yum, 
there's no way around needing some internet access, at least to those repositories, to make that happen. But we tend to find, as long as we're saying, well, you'll need that during the installation, you can prepare the machine images, and then you can cut the internet off. The clients have always been happy with that as a workaround. Um, and, of course, you're going to need networking in place between your two or more machines, just a private network, not the public internet. And so once you've got them past this bit, there's no internet access in what follows. So, um, the final thing to make it all work, yes, you need to, you need to take the uh, Docker images with you. So you'll find, and annoyingly, the only way to work this out at the moment is by doing it for yourself with internet access and then looking at what images have appeared. But we find that Kubernetes needs to pull some Docker images in order to work. So the best thing to do is run through this when it has got internet access and then do Docker images. You can see what it's downloaded onto the machine. You save all those with Docker save. And once you've loaded those into the target machines at the other end, it will all spray into life and start working and shouldn't need the public internet. So then you can, for example, use kubeadm to initialize your cluster. And of course, you need to make sure that whatever you're deploying into the cluster doesn't need public internet access. It's uh, fortunately quite a lot harder to slip up in back-end development than in front-end when it comes to accidentally relying on somebody else's uh, URLs. A few, a few tricks we've found over the years is uh, when we run our tests, units and functional, we tend to uh, install a security manager so that we spot and block any tests that are relying on the public internet. It's obviously a reliability problem anyway, so it's much better if we can make sure tests and code don't do that. And for bits that really do need to do that, you want to have some kind of option to work from an offline cache. So, um, one of the elephants in the room, you get this nice message printed out by KubeADM going, this is beta, don't use it in production, don't. But, it was alpha in Kubernetes 1.5, it went to beta in 1.6, we're hoping that the forthcoming 1.7 will make it production ready, and once you've initialized the cluster, you're not actually relying on this tool at all, so it's a question of saying to yourself, well, Where's the risk? You can look at what shape of cluster it sets up, but once you've used the beta tool to do the install, you're not reliant on it after that. And it is by far the simplest option for doing this. So for the moment, our strategy is we do use it and we hope to see it go to from beta to the real thing very soon. Now, what about upgrading? Unfortunately, this is one of the things that KubeADM <coughs> doesn't do yet or doesn't make easy. However, if you think back to the situation I described where you've got your big enterprise client, you're deploying your cluster for them and putting your containerized application on it, most of the time what you're doing here is something they're expecting to run in production for a number of years and probably only take security critical fixes and occasional updates. And given that there's no public internet in this scenario, one of the biggest attack vectors for older software is taken away straight away. So. Not too much of a concern. Um, we don't have a brilliant answer on that yet, but of course the other thing to think about, which I'll cover later, is that if you put all the important state on volumes or in databases outside the cluster, then the cluster itself is a transient thing and blowing it away and creating a fresh one isn't such a big job. So that was uh, something I alluded to. Um, what lives inside the cluster and what lives outside? If you've gone to all the trouble of making a cluster of containers, your first instinct would presumably be, well, let's put absolutely everything in there because then it can be any old Docker container, doesn't matter what's in it, doesn't matter, don't need to impose any system requirements on the client that they don't already have. But again, this is where reality comes up and often in these kind of enterprises, the database admins are quite protective of their little corner of the world and the idea that you can bypass the need for them by just sticking some databases in a container inside your cluster doesn't go down well with them at all. And for practical reasons as well, if your database is one of the most I.O. intensive parts of the application, you don't necessarily want to be running it inside a bunch of Docker containers with volumes attached to them. Sometimes running that directly on physical hardware might be better. Sometimes the client might have a preferred database, in which case they'll have a cluster of it and they'll have it backed up and they'll have it highly available. So let's take advantage of that. Um, so often we, um, 
we do say, well, all right, we can support, we use Hibernate, we can support anything you like for the relational part of this. So you might as well use your existing database cluster and we'll just configure our containers to point at it. So the only thing you then need to watch out for is that obviously there'll need to be some way of getting network-wise from the cluster to wherever they keep their databases and there'll need to be no firewalls in the way of that particular access which is not difficult to arrange, but in this kind of environment, it may be in the most extreme case that you have to submit your written request to the firewall team two weeks in advance, not discover when you're on site that you haven't done so. So what about upgrading the application running in these containers itself? Well, why don't we just do another Docker save and ship them a nice big bundle of images? Um, You'll find if you do this that it gets quite fat quite quickly because the total file system of the container building all the way back up to whatever it extended from can be quite big. But as I mentioned before, the bandwidth of FedExing a USB drive is pretty good. And if there's no internet access at the other end, that's often the best way to get things there anyway. So what we actually do in-house is as well as having a continuous deployment of our containerized applications, we also build an actual build artifact for each version, which is all of our different microservices as a Docker image bundle that you can download and walk away with as a self-contained thing. The other possibility is that you could try and run a Docker registry and you could say to the client, well, look, if you just allowed one bit of outbound internet access to our private registry over here, then you could download the images from that and wouldn't life be simple? But it's a bit messy running a Docker registry that requires authentication. If you're in a full-on commercial setting anyway, then it might not be such a bad thing to have to explicitly ship the binaries to people. Maybe you already have a system for doing that with other software. So security updates. Here's another one that people never seem to talk about. The answer if you're just running containers on AWS or on one deployment, wherever you like, is, well, you rebuild them nice and often, and by doing so, you make sure that whatever they're based on is always the newest, the latest and greatest, and that just naturally rolls in all the patches, make sure that there are no problems, no security holes lurking in there. But what if they're going to be running on a client site for some time? So we experimented with a few things on this. We actually at one point got as far as having someone spend half a day working out if you could run yum update or apt get update inside your Docker containers and then run commit. But that's really messy and also suffers from the fact that if there's no public internet access, then you can't do that. So we took a compromise approach. Our build process monitors every Docker file. Fortunately, you can only extend from one base image, and that has to be the first line in the file, so it's quite easy to run an audit over all of those and say, this is our approved list of base images. There's only about five of them, OpenJDK, Debian, one or two others. You must extend from one of these, and then we monitor. We use something like Black Duck to monitor the software inside them for vulnerabilities coming up in the Java, and we monitor the upstream mailing lists for security critical problems in the software we're taking in the base images. So in the relatively rare, but it does happen, event of a serious security hole affecting something that we're using, we say to the client, OK, here's your image bundle that contains the updated versions of these. So what about the on-site IT team in this scenario? Have they met containers before? Quite possibly not if they're in a more conservative or older enterprise. So we may, uh, may need to give them a bit of education. This is where Kubernetes can actually really help because one of the things it provides is a dashboard. So it's quite nice to be able to say to your on-site IT team, particularly if they're more used to Windows, here's this nice HTTP dashboard. It shows you the health of the application. You can go in and click through and see the logs. You can see whether everything's working. You can do all this from a browser. You don't need to get your hands dirty with the command line. That often goes over quite well. And in some ways goes over better than our previous iteration of things where we'd say, well, you need to install Tomcat and then you'll need to stick a few war files on it and you'll need to manage it from the command line. So that was an unexpected bonus. There's a little picture of the Kubernetes dashboard, so you get some nice metrics for free. You get to see the various different things that are deployed. And uh, as I say, talking people through this isn't too difficult, and you can provide a little, uh, we provide a little manual just giving the basic steps for troubleshooting and the most likely scenarios. Logging. So one of the downsides, or one of the things that needs to be managed about microservices development, as you know, is that 
instead of having one monolithic application which can pump everything through a handful of carefully chosen log channels and appear on disk or in a database somewhere, you've now got zillions of little services or you know maybe a hundred of them all writing their own log output so it's got to be brought together and managed somehow. Um, ELK stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana so this is a a way of aggregating and working with logs in this kind of environment so you install um, install an Elasticsearch index in your cluster and you use Logstash to feed all the logs through into there and Kibana is a nice web interface to search through them. Now there's one annoying thing we found about this which is that if you one of the common use cases if on-site IT can't solve it themselves then you want to be able to say to them, well, all right, just export the logs for the last 12 hours, email them to us, and we'll have a dig through, and we'll work out what's happened. Annoyingly, you can just see here if I show you for a moment, this is the Kibana web interface, and it's quite nice. Um, you can search through things, you can run queries, you can do visualizations, and you can see this is just a demo that I found online somewhere because I'm not running one locally. But you can see here we're aggregating the log statements from various different services. What's missing from this picture is a button labelled export. So you can identify the logs you want them to send you, but there isn't a handy button to dump them out as CSV or dump them out as Excel. So we're hoping Upstream Kibana will solve that for us. For now, the best solution we've come up with is that they need to work out which container is causing the problem, and then the Kubernetes dashboard lets them zero in on exactly what we want to see, and they can copy and paste it from there. So it's not very elegant, and uh, if Upstream doesn't do anything about that, then in the spirit of open source, we might try and do something about it ourselves. Backup and recovery. So you've got all these containers running, doing stuff. If you're running them in AWS, which we do for our own deployments, then it can be pretty straightforward. Um, you take snapshots of the AWS volumes involved, and if you're running databases on AWS, you can schedule automatic backups. I'm sure Azure does something similar. Uh, it all kind of works. You don't have to think too hard about it, although it's worth remembering in these things that it's not whether you run backups that's the question you should be asking. It's do you run restores? Have you actually tried blowing away the system and reconstructing it from what you backed up last night? If you haven't, don't let when something has gone wrong be the first time. So what you need is a documented and tested process for the client to run through on site. So what do we actually do to make that possible? Well, thinking back to what I said about how your cluster should be as stateless as possible, if your databases are an external thing, then that takes care of that. If the on-site DBA is running them, they know how to back those up, they know what to work with there. The only quirk that we've had to work out on that one is, if you've got multiple different stores in your application, maybe some of them are on disk and maybe some of them are relational, it may be that the order in which things are backed up starts to matter. So for example, if you've got some metadata in your database and some files on disk, then you need to do the backups in a certain order to avoid capturing a state where you might have some files that don't have associated metadata or you might have some associated metadata that doesn't have a file. So that's something that your architect needs to think about hard. Um, maybe the solution is to just put everything in as few data stores as possible, but if you start trying to stuff huge binary files into a database, then that has downsides of its own. But apart from that one quirk, yes, so you tell, tell the client to back up the databases in the usual way. If you've got something like Cassandra in the mix, you follow the advice on how to back that up. And then file systems, if you have everything mounted into your cluster as external volumes, then you say, well, back those up in the same way as you'd back up a file system. It's just a matter of making sure that you really can restore from these things to a working state. So what else? If we're trying to develop software which wants to be deployable as microservices, as a cloudy setup, um, but also on site like this, it does limit architectural choices a bit. Um, there are all sorts of APIs in AWS and in Azure for doing everything from sending email to machine learning. And sometimes, you know, on a rainy Tuesday when you've got to get something done, you look at them and go, oh, wouldn't it be nice if life was simple and I could use what Microsoft or Amazon have already done? But we can't, or at least we can't tightly integrate those as the only way to do something. Although we've also found that 
a good stick to beat our customers with, because obviously we'd love to get to a world where our customers get rid of this unhealthy obsession about having everything on site and just use our cloud. Wouldn't life be great? So one way of encouraging in that direction is to say, well, here's some nice, exciting functionality over and above the basic product. We'd love you to be able to use it, but you will need to either use our cloud deployment or allow access to this bit of cloud over here to make that work. Now, there is an interim state, which I haven't talked about much, but when we go and have a conversation with a potential customer about our software, what do we actually say to them? We say, well, you've got a few possibilities. You could buy it from us in the cloud. You can, we'll sell it to you multi-tenant. That's the preferred option because it's cheaper for you and it reduces resource overhead for us. If they've got deeper pockets but they're willing to take it in the cloud, we'll do them their own sort of isolated cloud deployment. We've found a middle ground with at least a few big customers, which is quite encouraging, which is that they're heavily invested in AWS or they're heavily invested in Azure themselves and they want us to take our stuff and put it in their AWS account or their Azure account. That works really well because, as I mentioned earlier, there are some really good tools for working with these things. So we say to them, if you just give us a few API keys, we'll do the install. We'll talk your IT guys through managing it. And then when we've done the install, you can revoke the keys we used to do it and it's all yours. So we've done that probably in more cases than we've done the, uh, the on-site thing. And that's definitely our second favorite option. So what do we leave to the customer? What do we explicitly leave out of scope from our install guide or say that it really depends to you? SSL, if it's anything other than our public cloud, then it's probably got the customer's domain name involved in access to it. That means they need to get hold of the SSL certificates. They need to install that and they need to work out what they're doing with various settings like strict transport security. What about Windows? So I mentioned earlier that our big enterprise customers love their Windows, and so far, it turns out that if people are big enough, they'll almost always be talkable into having some sort of Linux, because it won't be the only Linux in their IT estate. But what if somebody really digs their heels in and says, I really, really want this to work on Windows? Well, our, so far we've been lucky and we haven't encountered that, but our line is very much Microsoft are working very hard to solve that for us. Um, we've already got today the ability to run Linux Docker containers on Windows. All right, it's not recommended for production just yet, but there's a lot of work being done with hypervisors and things to make that possible. Um, there is a lot of work being done on Kubernetes to make it possible to run estates of Windows Docker containers. Given that most of the contents of our containers is just Java, we can envision a future where we build all of them twice, once as a Linux container with Java running inside it and once as a Windows container. Um, right now, if someone absolutely insisted on Windows, the best we could do is say, well, keep all the databases and data stores outside of the cluster and run a Linux VM or two to contain the cluster. So I realize I haven't quite managed to uh, Fill as much uh, fill as much time as I should, but I guess that gives us longer to go over any questions if anybody has them. Hi. So I said, how do we get the customer to send them to us? Um, there's a. I think there's a service called Logspout, which you can install and you can tell Docker to send all of the, uh, all of the logs through that and then that feeds them into, uh, into Logstash. Did you guys look at the uh, Docker log driver um, We have, and I think we've got a couple of deployments where we send everything to syslog, for example, but it uh, depends a bit what people want to do. Any others? Um, so the eventual destination for the logs is Elasticsearch, which then will be backed by some volumes. Um, so that's where they end up. And then I think it depends what you've done with the Docker log drivers as to how, how long they're kept by Docker itself. Any others? Hi.
Um, sometimes, and you're right, there has to be a better way than doing it completely by hand or copying the files around. I think one of the things we've not done and should do, given how many of our customers have it, is got some Red Hat for ourselves and properly played around with all of the, the value add in this space. And indeed, the fact that Red Hat are doing a lot of work with Kubernetes and with, um, with this kind of thing directly. Any more for any more? Oh, thank you for listening.